Crawford Greenwald. I'm named after my father, Crawford Halleck Greenwald. And the last name Greenwald is spelled G-R-E-E-N-E-W-A-L-T. But in early years in this country, the Greenwalds spelled their name various ways. So the present spelling uh, may go back several generations. My father was born in 1902 in August, and his mother was Mary Halleck, uh, that was her maiden name, Mary Halleck Greenwald, and his father was Frank Lindsay Greenwald. My grandmother was uh, born in Beirut in the uh, latter part of the 19th century. Her mother was Lebanese, her father was American, and at the time was the American consul in Beirut. My grandfather, uh, my father's father, came from a a uh, German family that had uh, come to this country from the Palatinate in Germany in uh, the first half of the 18th century, and they settled in Pennsylvania and had come to live around Fayetteville, which is not far from Chambersburg. And my uh, grandfather was born into a farming family, and he uh, and his older brother went into medicine and studied medicine. When my father was born, uh, my uh, grandfather was a doctor uh, practicing in Philadelphia and for a number of years he taught at Girard College in Philadelphia and was the resident physician there. My grandmother, to backtrack, had become interested in music at some time in her teens and uh, had been sent to Vienna to uh, study piano under a uh, then celebrated pianist called Theodore Leschetizky. And uh, my grandmother went sometime in the 1890s, right? 1890, well, middle, middle of the gay 90s, uh, to study with Leschetizky, and she studied there for a year. Uh, and came back and married uh, my grandfather that time. Uh, my father then born in the early years in 1902. And for quite a while my grandmother went on tour p playing the piano in this country and my grandfather was her manager and organized her her trips and her appearances. And when she stopped playing the piano, I'm not sure, but maybe 1910, maybe 1915, something like that. I don't think much later than that. That was the I think that was the end of her uh, professional piano playing career. Uh, he started in school at a, a, a German school and he learned German. He'd already learned German. He, he had a German nurse when he was a child and he used to say that he learned German before he learned English. And his parents approved of German. They thought that was a respectable language to learn so they encouraged that. And uh, my uh, grandfather used to read uh, German fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales, to my father in German. I have the book, which uh, was owned by my father, uh, which they read. So my father knew German when he went to the German school in Philadelphia. He had that. And uh, I don't know whether all classes were taught in German, but I think they were. And uh, he got a good education there, and he said much later, that it was the education in that school which enabled him to go to Penn Charter School and to get in at a rather early age, two years younger than the rest of his class. So he uh, studied at Penn Charter and then from there went on to MIT um, in Boston, then in Boston. So this picture shows my father, this picture shows my father when he, uh, when he was at MIT and uh, uh, he enjoyed uh, dramatic performances to some extent. I don't know how much. And he had a mentor there, slightly older than he was, called Harry Gribble. And uh, Harry Gribble probably inspired him to act in school plays like the one that you're seeing where he's in the chorus. And I think he was not so interested that he was ever a lead in plays or musical dramas. So the chorus is probably what he fitted into and uh, and enjoyed. At MIT he majored in chemical engineering and he began working for the DuPont Company soon after he graduated, very soon after he graduated, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, which would have been in 1922. 
and he may have been uh, chosen the he may have chosen the Dupont Company uh, because of uh, family connections. His aunt was married to uh, William Kemble Dupont, who had worked in the powder mills for the Dupont Company, and uh, he may have become interested in the company through his aunt and uncle and their family. Well, he had come to Wilmington regularly to meet, to, uh, his aunt and uncle had regularly invited him to Wilmington when he was a small child, uh, and because he had a first cousin the same age, that was Halleck DuPont, and they played together, and my father used to come to Wilmington uh, regularly and to, to see family, and saw the larger family as well, and uh, according to my mother, my father attended his, uh, her first birthday party, was invited because their parents knew each other, and, and my mother's mother had invited uh, daddy as a child, so they, uh, my mother and father knew each other from a very early age. And he moved to Wilmington and lived in the, uh, what was then the uh, Vic Mead Hunt Club, which is not in the same place where it is now. It's now uh, the house where Jamie Wyeth lives, if that's of any interest. <laughs> so I can't really, he may have lived in the YMCA too. He started very early at, in the experimental station and the DuPont Company, but I don't know whether he began there or not. I don't, I don't know that. And uh, uh, when his courtship began, uh, I don't know, but uh, he became very interested in my mother, and uh, uh, according to him, later on, he proposed to her many times before she accepted, and, uh, uh, but she finally did. And uh, you know, there's a, a little story about that, too because they were uh, uh, testing and counting milk, which was produced on my maternal grandparents' farm. And my grandmother didn't believe in um, homogenizing uh, milk, uh, and so it was raw milk, which she produced, and it had to be uh, watched very carefully. And my parents were involved in testing the milk, and, uh, uh, counting the parts, make, making sure it was all right, uh, when for the umpteenth time uh, my father popped the question and to his astonishment uh, uh, my mother accepted him. So there's that story and uh, uh, that uh, took place in the basement of my grandparents house. I was just down in that basement yesterday and my uncle confirmed that that's where the engagement took place. My, my paternal grandparents had a summer house in Wildwood in New Jersey, and my maternal grandparents used to go to uh, Cape May, and they used to see each other in the summers uh, uh, at that time. They, the families independently would go there, uh, some, a place that was nearby by the ocean, in the summer, and so they must have seen each other there, but I don't know how often. Sometime later, in the 20s, in the late 20s, they started going to Bermuda, and they liked it very much. So they would go by ship, because that was the only way to get to Bermuda. There were no plane flights at that time, and uh, they rented various places to stay, various cottages to stay, and they probably stayed for two weeks because I think my father didn't get any more vacation uh, uh, on up into the 1950s. He, it was a two-week vacation for him. So they, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed the, uh, the, uh, the lack of, of uh, motor vehicles and they liked to ride around on bicycles together and uh, they enjoyed the quiet life in Bermuda. They liked swimming, they liked goggling, looking at the fish under, under the water, the tropical fish. Uh, they liked to go dancing, and there were places in Bermuda where you could go out and, uh, and dance, which they, uh, they enjoyed ballroom dancing very much. So 
that was their vacation in Bermuda. And they sometimes went down with friends of theirs, too. And as time went on, they uh, married couples that they enjoyed. Uh, close friends would, would go down with them, and they would have a kind of house party. Yeah. Well, he, he enjoyed playing with his children uh, and uh, uh, figuring out what they were interested in and what, uh, uh, what they would enjoy. He was very good at figuring that out, and he made a set of uh, building blocks for me, uh, and which still exist, and they're uh, largish blocks of white and dark wood, and you could build all kinds of things with them. And he uh, cut the blocks himself and smoothed them and trimmed them, put them in a little chest, which he made, and uh, put my name on the top. Uh, he, he thought out what his children would be interested in, and uh, he enjoyed seeing them uh, develop and grow. As far as I know, my father never played a musical instrument as a child, although his mother uh, was a concert pianist. But I don't know that he uh, was given lessons in any instrument as a child. But his engagement present, or maybe his wedding present from my mother, was a clarinet. And he learned to play it. And within two or three years, he'd begun to play the cello. And he enjoyed both of those, and uh, both of those instruments, and he enjoyed playing. And uh, he and my mother and uh, uh, friends, a couple who were uh, good friends, used to play string quartets together uh, in their early marriage. And my father used to say, we were just terrible, but we had so much fun. That's great. That's very good. So hopefully we can find that quiet evening at home. Bill. Yeah, There's that was, that was, uh, he, he was very, he, he had a, uh, a good ear for music, and he really enjoyed music, and having played it, he was, of course, able to judge any number of things, which people who haven't played, don't, like myself, don't know how to do. And uh, uh, he very much enjoyed the cello, and he uh, uh, very much enjoyed the playing of Pablo Casals, uh, to the extent that in 1950, when Casals agreed to uh, perform, uh, he was very much anti-Franco, uh, Casals was, uh, in a, when he agreed to uh, uh, hold a series of concerts in southern France in a small town in the Pyrenees called Prade. Uh, my mother and father went there to hear that concert. They had a wonderful time. Uh, and they they liked what my father used to call the, the zing and the nye of uh, Casals playing. And similarly, uh, they enjoyed musicians who played in the same kind of way. And one of them was Fritz Kreisler in the, in the violin. Uh, and then there's a clarinet player, and the name has gone out of my mind right now, so I can't think of it. Reginald Kell. Reginald Kell, the uh, clarinet player. And he had this same kind of somewhat romantic way of playing, which appealed to both my parents. And they, they enjoyed that. And they said, yes, we know Fritz Kreisler sometimes make mis makes mistakes when he plays. We don't mind that. He has this quality of playing, which appeals to us. I think those three uh, musicians, Reginald Kell and Pablo Casals, and Fritz Kreisler played their instruments in the same kind of way, which uh, they were great favorites of my parents, those, th those three musicians and their way of playing. And my mother took me to hear a concert, uh, clarinet con uh, concert by Reginald Kell. I, I did hear him play, the only one of the three that I, I actually heard myself. It's interesting. Um, let's see. The film about the uh, scramble of eggs. Can we, why don't you talk about that now? Because we do have that yes, film. Yeah. And so maybe you can talk about um, how that was organized, as you explained, and then you know, mm -hmm. your dad, how much he liked it or didn't like playing the villain or you know, whatever you want to yeah. say. Well, the, the film was organized by uh, some younger aunts, some younger sisters of my mother and their friends. 
uh, and most of a series of films, uh, of which this was one, and this one is the only one in which my father appeared. And uh, he played the role of the villain, which I think he enjoyed, and my mother, uh, so I'm told, was very pleased that uh, her younger siblings and their friends had invited my father to, uh, to play in this movie. Uh, he never played in any others, and I'm not sure that he wanted to in, in particular, but he enjoyed that part. And uh, he and his friends made one home movie, uh, which was a whodunit. And that's the only uh, other film of that kind that I know of in which my father acted. Uh, my father didn't actually act in that. He, took, he, was the, uh, he ran the movie camera. So how elaborate was this? This um, maybe we can talk a little more about this. The, the film I haven't seen it. How elaborate was it? Not terribly elaborate. It it's set in in modern times, uh, and some things look very antiquated now, of course, because it was uh, filmed in whatever it was, the late 1920s, and uh, or early 30s, probably late 1920s, and so the the, the uh, the automobiles are of that vintage, and but otherwise not terribly elaborate, not terribly elaborate. There's a sequence of uh, canoeing uh, when the heroine's uh, canoe is overturned, and uh, my father swims out to try and get her, and I forget what the denouement is. I think he's bashed over the head with a uh, with a canoe oar uh, until he stops his pursuit, and uh, but it's not a terribly elaborate uh, film. My, par my parents loved to dance. Uh, they, they loved to dance and they were very good at it. It was ballroom dancing. And their idea of fun for a weekend was to go to New York and uh, see a play one night and go dancing, have dinner and go dancing uh, the second night. And they enjoyed that very much. And uh, throughout their life they uh, enjoyed dancing. And their idea of a good party was to go to a dinner dance or to give a dinner dance. Uh, uh, rolling back the rug after dinner and to putting on the phonograph, that was part of their lives. Of course, growing up in the 20s, that was the thing that people did. They were both very good at dancing. He would be photographing hummingbirds in the summer outside his house in Delaware. And these would be still pictures, not moving pictures, with the strobe lights, which uh, were what stopped down the image of the bird with its uh, uh, wing beat, with, with its wings fully stopped so that you could see uh, individual feathers. That was the objective of my father's photography of the hummingbirds, to, to have a, a, an image which showed clearly the bird in mid-flight uh, with its wings absolutely still. And since the hummingbird has a very rapid wing beat, it was difficult to do that, to achieve that. That was one of the challenges that, uh, that led my father from photographing uh, songbirds uh, in the winter to hummingbirds with their much faster wing beat. The hummingbird interest uh, it, uh, drew him uh, geographically to other parts of this country and to South America because on the east coast of the United States there's only one kind of hummingbird as I understand, the ruby throat, whereas there are many more varieties on the west and in South America. He began to go to South America uh, to photograph hummingbirds in uh, Ecuador and especially in Brazil and he and my mother made many trips together to, uh, to do that. Uh, my mother always accompanied my father and helped him out uh, whenever she could. Uh, let him alone when he wanted to be alone to photograph, but was always there to, to help, and he uh, always traveled with her. Um, now that very, remember the very cute picture of the two of them where, where he's reading in the chair and he's the oh, yes. was just about going backwards, yeah. and we were going to talk about his, that she swept him off his feet and was very devoted. Yeah. We want to talk about that. Well, it's, uh, uh, th this is a, a, the picture is probably a publicity picture. It's one of a series, but uh, this is a very natural picture. 
uh, with my father in his, uh, in his uh, reclining chair and reading some kind of business report. Uh, my father would, my mother would come into the room and he would say, oh, come over here and sit next to me. And uh, they were very affectionate. And so that's a, this is a, a very typical kind of picture, even though it may have been taken for publicity purposes. It's the kind of thing that happened regularly. My father, my mother coming to sit on the edge of the chair where my father was. And so he's obviously looking up at her with delight. And he always seemed very relaxed. Uh, although he had a lot of pressure uh, from business, and yet he managed to find time to uh, attend to other interests. Uh, and one of my father's friends said to me that my father worked hard and he played hard. My, my father w was not an avid sports fan, and he did not play golf, although the sweater may seem to suggest that, the game that he really liked to play was tennis. He and my mother both played tennis a lot. They enjoyed that. Uh, and into their 60s, they continued to play tennis. Uh, my parents went to Bermuda, and at that time, in the late 20s, and through the 30s, through the 30s, uh, there uh, were no motor vehicles in Bermuda, except, I think, for the fire engine. There was a train. Uh, but otherwise, people went by horse carriage or bicycle and my parents enjoyed uh, bicycling together. And they used to say it was so nice you could ride side by side and talk. Uh, that was in a reference to the uh, motorbikes which became popular after the war, and which of course make a lot of noise and you can't hear each other talk, you can't talk together. Holman Halleck was my father's great-grandfather and he was a member of the American Missionary Board, which ultimately established, established schools in the Middle East, in Istanbul, and in what is today Lebanon, what at that time was the Ottoman Empire. And he was charged, he was a printer in the United States, and he was charged with printing books in Arabic and finding a way to create Arabic type. And he did figure out a way of doing that, and the picture shows him with the instrument, which was a kind of pentagram which was used and which continued, continued to be used for many years thereafter for printing the Arabic script. Now, this is about all I can say because there is more information of what that script was called. It had a special name and, uh, and I don't know yeah. that. But that's in the, this article which yeah. uh, well, you know, is back in Berkeley. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, but it might be interesting and they, yeah. Yeah. that explains yeah. more of it. So. You can read the article when you see it and then see if you yeah, want it or not. Sure, and cover sure. So uh, the uh, Holman Halleck's son, Samuel Halleck, was also involved with the American Missionary Board and he was also the American uh, uh, consul in Beirut where he married his second wife uh, from whom my father is descended. He married a Lebanese girl called Sarah Tabbitt and their eldest child was my grandmother, Mary Halleck. She lived in Lebanon until she was 11 uh, and then came to the United States for the first time. So she was brought up in the ambiance of a, uh, a Christian Arabic uh, home. We have the picture of Henry Clay Greenwald. Why don't you just say a little bit about him? No, I wish I knew more. But, but this is Henry Clay Greenwald, who was my father's grandfather, the father of his father. And uh, he lived in Chambersburg and Fayetteville and was a farmer, basically, but I think was also involved in local politics. You know, there's more to it than that, and one could easily find out, but I don't know what it you know, what it was. I was in... You don't, do you remember your dad coming back, going back and forth on the train? Or? I do not remember much of that. that. He would go away, come back. I would be farmed out to my grandparents to stay many times. But, you know, it was... Uh, I, was I thought this is what life was like. Uh, uh, father away a lot and so forth. So, uh, 
I don't remember enough before that so for to have made a, a, a much of an impression. That's you know, you did, when did we get into the war forty one and. Uh, um, what if, what's your impression of? I mean, do you want to say something about his his becoming the president of Dupont? And do you remember that? When that happened? I do remember that, but I can't really say much about it. I, I think I'm not. Uh, I remember that happening. He became vice president, and then very shortly after, he became the president in the summer of 1948, I think. But I really can't tell you very much about okay. that. So. Now, do you have any any comments more on the uh, plant growing and all his contraptions that he used to capture the growth of plants? Do you remember anything about that? Yes, I do remember that, but not very well. He was he was taking time lapse pictures of plants when I was a kid, uh, very much taking these movies of uh, time-lapse uh, pictures in color, but I don't really know what's, I don't know very much about that, so. Okay. Um, and my sister, uh, Nancy, may know more yeah. than that. Well, all right, how about, one thing that your siblings talked about was how much he liked his work. He told David, actually, um, one of his, piece of his advice was find out what you like you would like to do and do that. I mean, can you remember any advice your dad? Yes. Did? Yes, he said he did say exactly that to us. And uh, he said uh, he said I don't care what you do, uh, but uh, find something you want to do and then do it. Um, and work hard, work at it. That was his advice. Uh, he said I don't care what you do, what kind of subject you choose. Choose something you want to do and then work hard at it. Or work at it was what he said, really. He didn't say work hard. That was implied. The work hard was implied. Okay. Did he encourage you to, to study hard? Is he, how did he value education, your education? Yes, he did. Uh, he did uh, encourage that and work at it. And finally, it sunk in. And he spoke quite severely about my grades, which were poor. and. Uh, indicated in a completely unthreatening manner that uh, the objective was to learn something and that I should be doing that. Uh, and that, my mother made the same point, and that point sunk in. And there was, you know, nothing about, we're doing a lot for you to send you to a good school and, or we hope to send you to a good college. There was no reference to that at all. It was just the uh, responsibility that people have to work at what they're doing in their courses. He was also very good at explaining things clearly, and my sister maybe could explain this, can do better on this. But he was, he had a very, what's called an incisive mind today. He saw things very clearly. He immediately saw the essence of a problem. He got that very quickly. Uh, and so he could speak to that issue in a discussion. So I think whereas where many people have a difficulty finding out what the core of the problem is, that wasn't difficult for him. He, he saw it instantly. Uh, and that's the essence of the difficulties. And once you have that core, you can begin to work on it. So he, he had that ability. And uh, an offshoot, which we all benefited from, was that he could explain things very, very well. So when we had, didn't understand something and we could ask, he could either explain it very clearly or he could use examples and models that we would get. When he saw we didn't understand, he would, had a way of explaining it and making it simple. He was very good at that. He would have been a great teacher. And, uh, he taught informally with people, and uh, he, so he was a great teacher. Uh, right after the war, uh, Enrico Fermi uh, asked my father who, if he would be interested in working with him in the University of Chicago. And my father was apparently uh, very interested in doing that. He, he greatly admired Fermi as a scientist and as a person, and uh, was very interested in the possibility of working with him. According to my sister, he was torn whether to go or to stay, and eventually decided he'd stay with the DuPont Company where he began uh, his work. And at that time, it was not at all clear that he was 
going to continue to be promoted in the DuPont Company, uh, and nor was it clear that Enrico Fermi was not going to live very much longer. And so if he had gone to work in uh, Chicago with Fermi, Fermi wouldn't have been there to work with for uh, soon thereafter. He died of cancer, as you know. That's a good story. That's a good story. One of the things that, that Judge uh, Adams commented on was that he entertained him with a series of records, primarily Cole Porter. <laughs> Do you remember Cole Porter as somebody he loved? No. No, okay. No, I okay. don't. But that's the era that my father liked. That's the era, but I'm, I'm surprised. I don't know that he had, of the music that my parents played, uh, they, they played uh, Broadway shows. And I remember the ones that came out during the war and, and right after the war, um, uh, And You Get Your Gun uh, and Oklahoma and ones that followed on Kiss Me Kate and South Pacific. They liked those, that my parents both liked those, and they liked classical music. But I don't remember uh, Cole Porter songs uh, or Irving Berlin songs being played at all at home. I may have written to you earlier about family breakfasts in the uh, 1950s when I was in school, before I went away to college, and indeed after that too, and when my brother and sister were away. So. Uh, breakfasts were uh, always a family affair. We always ate together. And uh, so I was very often have had breakfast with my mother and father. And they always, uh, it was always a breakfast of conversation. Uh, no one read a newspaper. Uh, and my parents talked about their common interests or problems that they had and what they had to deal with. And they talked about everything in front of me and involved me uh, very often. And my father talked a lot about his interests at that time. But it was a wonderful beginning to the day. And I thought at the time, if I ever have children, I want to raise them with this kind of beginning of the day, this kind of breakfast, where it, it's, it's a family gathering and it's conversations. That was true also of dinner. We always had dinner together. Uh, and when there was lunch, uh, when we were around, we had lunch together. But those breakfasts together at the beginning of the day with conversations, uh, were, were very, a very wonderful part. And my parents often talked about their uncertainties, hesitations, should we do this, should we do that? I wish we hadn't done that. Uh, we made a mistake when we did that. And uh, a lot of that rubbed off. And I think it was more effective way of uh, communicating moral issues and, than if they'd sat me down and lectured me about the same subjects because they shared their own experience and were not talking directly to me. And I don't think they were trying to give me a message. I think they were honestly talking back and forth about, uh, about their problems and issues in their lives. Those breakfasts were wonderful. It was a wonderful part of our life. And. Uh, and we were, uh, you know, we, we very much shared in them, so that my parents weren't, although they were all talking to each other, they weren't talking over us, or weren't talking over me at all. Uh, so I was very much a part of this conversation, even when I, I just sat quietly and uh, didn't contribute anything of my own. You know, that, that was a wonderful part of home life. Well, my, my, uh, from my own uh, uh, professional interests, my father was very supportive of my interests in archaeology. It was not an interest he had. He was interested in Roman history, and he used to read Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, from time to time. But he, he was not particularly interested in archaeology. But he very much supported my interest. and. Uh, he urged my mother to take my older brother and myself to Rome because I had never been abroad when I was 15. Uh, and uh, to, so I could see uh, one of the great cities of antiquity and uh, ancient sites around about. That was my father's idea. 
And uh, so he didn't go on that trip. He couldn't. He couldn't take the time off. But it was his idea. And uh, uh, I'll have to think a bit about the other thing I wanted to mention along that line, which has gone out of my mind. Um, oh, it was when, when I was taking my general exams at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, at uh, that time at Penn, we had three days. And you wrote an exam all day long, uh, three days in a row. And uh, I was very nervous about the exam. And uh, I was partly living in Philadelphia, partly living at home. And although I didn't talk about it with my parents, it was, must have been very obvious that I was uh, nervous. And when I got through the exams, my father went to a local bookstore and bought a book on ancient Greek history, as it turned out, and gave it to me as a present. And uh, I was uh, delighted and also very surprised. I didn't realize that he uh, was thinking that much about my situation. And uh, uh, so he gave me this book, which, which was a, a, a treasure under the circumstances. Uh, and at one time, there was some mild difficulty, some problem that I was having. And I talked it over with my father. And uh, very, I was very reluctant to talk about it, but somehow the subject came up. So we discussed it. And I said, I'm really terribly sorry to <clears throat> bother you with this, because I know you're busy with all kinds of much more important things. And this is so trivial. <clears throat> and my father said, no, it's not at all. This is, this is a problem that you're going through. And of course, it has to be resolved. It's not silly. It's not trivial. This is part of your life at this time. I can't remember what it was. But it, it certainly was very trivial. And I was embarrassed to talk about it. And he was so nice about it, so decent about it. 